pray in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ that I would not be seen nor heard today, but God, my heart's desire is, is that you alone would be seen and heard working through me. God, that as a church, we would collectively and individually give you all of the honor, glory, credit, and praise. You're worthy of it all. There is no one else worthy of it. And so, Father, I pray that if anyone's here with any burdens, that right now they would lay them down. They would be done with it. They would hand it over to you. And that we would be able to see, hear, think, and receive clearly in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name and blood, everyone said together, amen. Amen and amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. Amen. He's worthy. He's worthy. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to John chapter 8, verse 2. If you do not have a good study Bible, pay attention to me. If you do not have a good study Bible, we give them away for completely free. There's no strings attached. We just want to bless you with the Bible. Uh, please come see me or one of the brothers at the door on your way out and just say, hey, I want one of the free Bibles that they were talking about. You don't have to fill a card out or anything like that. We just give it to you. And we believe that God wants his word in your life. Amen. How many people have been changed by the word of God? Amen. 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 John chapter 8, beginning with the second verse, the Word of God says this, praise unto the Lord. Early in the morning he came again to the temple, he is Jesus. Early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now when the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, what's it say, church? Sin no more. Look at your neighbor say, Be done with it. The scribes and the Pharisees knew Jesus was teaching in the temple. And they had plotted this plan to try and to catch him. Their ultimate goal at this point is to have Jesus arrested and taken away. Allow me for a moment, if you will, to set the scene, church. Jesus is teaching in the temple. People are listening. People are learning. It's a really great thing taking place. And God is moving in their midst. And all of a sudden, a group of religious people, isn't that a shame? <laughs> a group of religious people. I tell you, religious people will mess you up. Yeah, a, group of us, a group of us went out really late the other night after the conference to eat. And I asked this lady a question. She was our waitress, and I asked her before we left. Uh, it, it was like 11. It was late, 11, 11, 15 at night. It was really late. We were there. And I asked her, I said, I, I want to ask you the most important question you've probably ever been asked in your entire life. And she says, what's that? And I said, do you know who Jesus is? And she says, yeah, but I choose not to believe in him. She said, I was raised in church. I went to church, even went to a Christian school. But it's the Christians that pushed me away from church. And Brother Ken was there. He looked at her and he said, on behalf of all the Christians, I apologize to you. Isn't it something about religious people? God in flesh is in their midst. And the scribes and the Pharisees show up. This group of religious people, they show up with one goal in mind. They want to try to stump the teacher, capital T, Jesus Christ. They want to try to stump the teacher. All of the people in the room, of all of the people in the room, the scribes and the Pharisees 
should have been sitting at the feet of Jesus that day learning within the temple. But isn't that just like the devil? When all is calm, when all is good, when everything's going in life as planned, the enemy will show up and make an attempt to ruin everything in your life. Raise your hand if you've been there before. Everything's going good. Everything, I mean, going so good, you're like looking around like, what's coming next, man? <laughs> this is going too smooth right here. What's, what's going next? Isn't it something? Understand this, church. Understand this. If the enemy did it to Jesus, don't think he won't do it to you. If the enemy did it to Jesus... He will do it to you too. Everything was going good. See, this is what boggles my mind about Christians who get so upset when other Christians go through something. It's as if we're surprised that the church is under attack. Wait a minute. That should be normal. And if you weren't taught that in your ideology of whatever church you came from, they lied to you and you got a false sense of the gospel message. Jesus himself said, the narrow way is hard. The narrow way is hard. This is why I can't get down in the dumps when people go through stuff. My Lord told me they would. And my Lord is not a liar. The narrow way is hard, wide, and broad, and easy is the road that leads to destruction. So I expect to go through stuff. I expect to have burden. I expect to take burden and give it unto the Lord. My Lord said it's going to be hard. So I can't get weighed down. I can't get bogged down whenever I go through something, whenever my wife goes through something, whenever you go through something, because it's to be expected. See, this is going to be hard for some people to say, but look at your neighbor and say, it's normal. See, listen, the truth is, is that some Christians in this room have a hard time digesting that. Oh, my Lord said we have victory. Yes, you do, but in order to win, you got to fa face a battle. See, I know today's culture just wants to hand out free trophies for not going through nothing, but <laughs> call me old school. Call me old school. I like to earn my trophies because I went through something. If I just looked at a trophy and said, yeah, they just gave me that because my mama paid the dues. I want to know that I was beside some people and that I sweated with them. I fought with them. I bled with them. I cried with them. I prayed with them. I anticipated seeing the hand of God with them. I went into prayer with great expectation with them. It ain't supposed to be easy down here. It doesn't get easy until eternity. It's not supposed to be easy. It's a war down here. See, if we can get, see, this is, this is where the church really divides in their belief system across the world. If I was to tell you that the Bible says we battle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, the principalities, the authorities, the rulers of the dark, the darkness in the heavenly realm, which is up in the air. You would have most Christians saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. But as soon as you tell them going through some junk is normal, they say, no, nah, come on. I live in victory, pastor. I live in victory. Yeah, but remember, in order to get there, you had to beat something or someone first. See, the problem with thinking that you don't have to go through something is that once reality hits and you do go through it, it wrecks you. It will wreck you. Man, and it can put you down and down and down to where you can't even see straight. It will wreck you. And so we've got to understand as a church that that stuff is normal. You say, oh my gosh, I'm not coming back to this man's church. What is he preaching? The truth. The truth. Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life. And he says, few find it. And he says, it's hard. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. Jesus gets us through it. Now, this is kind of, this is kind of strange for some people to say out loud. Some of you go giggle when you do it, but it's still the truth. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a winner. Look at somebody else different and say, I'm a winner. I mean, I just, I just think it's cool that I'm on the winning team. 
you know? I mean, anybody else glad that your team wins on this one? I mean, if there was, if there was ever a game to win, man, the one called life is it. Amen. The, 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 one, the one called life is it. As a coach, as a competitive coach, I've been through seasons where we won everything and it was too easy. And I'll be honest with you, I got bored. You know, when you beat a team 22 to 2 on the baseball field, I started thinking about everything else I could be doing at home. I could be cutting the grass, I could be fishing, I could be cleaning the garage, other stuff that I could enjoy doing around the house. And man, it's no fun beating somebody 22 to 2. Because once you get up to a certain age level, there is no slaughter rule anymore. They got to take it like a man, and you got to learn how to lose. And so you just keep playing until the time runs out on the time limit. When I go through something, though, and I beat a team that actually was scrappy, yeah. I felt better about winning. Amen. See, this is where the church has missed it. We go through something, we get down. No, no, no. We actually should rise up. Amen. You say, explain that. Well, Paul talked about it. He said that uh, when you go through something, perseverance leads to this, and leads to this, and leads to this, and leads to this, and it's all to make you better. Can you say amen to that? Amen. It's only to make you better. But as long as we let the burden of the fight bog us down, we can't get better. Amen. So really what we're doing is we're looking at it, we're looking at it through the wrong lens. Look at John chapter 8, verse 3. Because what happens here is they bring the woman before Jesus Everyone else who was there being taught in the temple that day, she's brought before them, and they put both her and her sin on display. Isn't that embarrassing? Isn't that embarrassing? They put both her and her sin on display. But the truth is, there's not anyone in this room that hasn't sinned within the past few days. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? Raise your hand if you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God before. Oh, look around at these normal people. Look around and all, raise your hand again if you've sinned this week. Look at all the people that need Jesus. Amen. Amen. Look at all the people that need Jesus. This is why God so loved you that he sent him here for you. What good news? What good news? Amen. See, this is, this is why we have to understand we go through things. Just because we receive Jesus doesn't mean sin stops. I'm supposed to stop wanting to sin, yes, but sin is still around. Do you understand what I'm saying? And if anything, it's trying to pull me into being the old me. Do you understand? And I've got to die to that stuff. I mean, the battle is real. Look at verse 3, John chapter 8, verse 3. Let's look at what happens. The scribes and the Pharisees bought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. So where, according to Scripture, did they place her? They placed her in the midst of the room. She's on trial at this very moment. Do you see that? They place her in the midst. Jesus is teaching in the temple. There is a crowd there listening, and they take this woman and they shame her. They take this woman and they humiliate her by placing her right in the midst of the group. Listen to me. If Satan can get us to focus on other people, he has a great shot at keeping us from ever looking at ourselves. Amen. Hear that. If he can keep me looking at you and you and you and you and you and you and you, he's got a great shot at making me not evaluate myself. Because I'm so busy taking inventory of you and you and you and you and you and you. But isn't that easy to do as people watchers? Isn't that easy? It's always easier pointing out where someone else is messed up rather than ourselves. Because with my stuff, I've got to fix it. I've got to want to deal with it. But if I look at other people, I don't have to deal or mess with that. Isn't that something? If all I'm doing is taking time looking at what everyone else is doing in life, how can I ever have the time personally to inventory my own life? And so we cannot get caught up in judging others but we can get caught up in praying for them. Amen. Listen, we can get caught up in praying. Matter of fact, if you're taking notes, jot that down. Don't judge them. Pray for them. Amen. Seriously, pray for them. 
Matthew 23, 23. It's concerning something interesting. I want us to turn there. Let's go there. Matthew 23, 23. Let's go there quickly. Matthew 23, 23. And I tell you, since you're already going to be there, you can go to the third verse too. Look at the end of the third verse, what Jesus says concerning the scribes and the Pharisees. He's specifically talking about these same scribes and Pharisees. And in 23, verse 3, we'll start there. If you look at the end of the verse, here's what he says about the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, for they preach, but they do not what? Practice. They preach, but they do not practice. I don't know why, but the Spirit is just really compelling me in this way, and I did not plan on, on taking this angle on this, but this this is definitely something that the Holy Spirit is putting in me about carrying, carrying stuff that we should not be carrying. Look, for they preach, but they do not practice. What we don't want to do is be a Christian that preaches victory and we carry everybody's burden. There ain't no victory in that. <laughs> what we don't want to do is preach one thing and look miserable simply because so many people are going through. We, even though we go through something, we still have life. We still have the life of God within us. And what he's dealing with is these scribes and Pharisees. He says they preach one thing, but they don't practice what they're out there preaching. Look at the 23rd verse. Jesus says, watch this woe. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites! Saying one thing, doing another. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and what church? Faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides. Again, he's talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, you blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Watch this. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Look, I don't know if you picked up on it or not, but Jesus ain't happy with these people. I mean, this is a big deal. They want to take this woman and they humiliate her and they take her and they set her down in front of this, this, uh, this temple where Jesus is teaching trying to really chip, trip, trip Jesus up, hoping that they can catch him in something, and they're willing to ruin this woman in the process. He says, oh, you hypocrites. Whitewashed tombs. Whitewashed tombs. If the inside of a man becomes clean, the outside eventually lines up. But we cannot clean just the outside expecting the heart to change. It ain't never going to happen. The heart must be what changes first. And then the outside behaviors change with it based on the heart. You see, it's Jesus Christ who makes the kind of heart change that will change a person forever. Everything else other than Christ is temporary and short-lived. It always is. John chapter 8, go back there with me. <clears throat> John chapter 8, verse 4. We're going to pick up where we left off. This is what the scribes and the Pharisees, this is what they say to Jesus. In John chapter 8, verse 4, Scripture says, praise the Lord, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to what church? 
see, they, they weren't really worried. See, this is the sad thing. Look up here for a moment. Look up here for a moment. They really weren't even concerned about the woman anyway, were they? They said all this to do what to Jesus? To test them. So they're willing to drag her through and humiliate her in front of these people. They were more worried about trying to catch Jesus than they were trying to love and change a woman. Think about that. Think about that. But, you know, society has not gotten any better. And oftentimes in church, we can, just, we can be just as guilty as the scribes and the Pharisees there. We've got to be careful. We've got to remember that there was a day where you and I weren't saved either. And what we cannot get into the position of doing is treating this like a country club and being upset when someone comes through the, through the door that doesn't look like us, smell like us, dress like us, act like us. God forbid it ever happened like that. So what we cannot do is someone come in here with their sin and their bondage and their baggage and they're not saved. And what we cannot do is expect them to be perfect like us. So here's a newsflash. We ain't perfect either. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't perfect. And look, 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 you can look, look, look at him again, say, you're not perfect, and I know you're not because I live with you. I mean, some of you, some of you probably argued this morning before you came to church. Some of you probably were fighting like nasty cats and dogs before you went to bed last night. And here you find yourself at church. God bless you, you still chose to come in the midst of that storm. Amen. But how could we expect someone to hit a level that we have problems attaining ourselves sometimes? Amen. You know, as parents, I was sharing this with my wife uh, this morning. As parents, isn't it something that we could be guilty of trying to raise our children with the expectation of living like an adult just because we're an adult? And we quickly forget what it is to be children, don't we? How many people in this room used, used to, not now, used to be a teenager? Go ahead, older people. Okay, put them down for a minute. Because I want the young people to get freed up here. Okay, let's go bless my young people that's in the room right now. For all of those used-to-be teenagers, I want you to raise your hand if you screwed up a whole lot. All right, hands down for a minute. Because I, like, I feel like a burden's lifting. I feel a heaviness lifting. I feel a, I feel a weight going up in the air. And the young people are rising up. But isn't it something that in the name of, well, I don't want them to make the same mistakes I did. We begin to judge them more harshly with less grace and mercy that we wanted our folks to give to us. Now, young people, your pastor's not saying this to give you a free pass to go screw up. But older, mature, seasoned people, if we did less yelling and more talking, we might, we might reach somebody. And I'm guilty of it. I'm preaching to myself right now. If, if, I, if, if, I, if I would not expect my 16-year-old to be 40 like me. But here's the news flash. I have to remind myself, dude, you're 40 and still can't figure it out. Amen. Anybody else with me? Amen. Right? So, 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 look, don't raise your hand on this one. Because if you do, you're going to be lying. And that's a sin. So, a trick question. All right? I'm loading up a trick question. Raise your hand if you're perfect. Had to be my dad. And we'll have counseling as soon as church is over. The young people, we're, we're expecting them to hit a level of perfection that, that we're not even hitting as grown people. But I believe that the enemy's using that, even within the church today, to, to divide and conquer. And so what it's actually doing is pushing people away from service unto the Lord because they already feel unworthy to be able to hit a mark. Amen. A mark that we never hit anyway. Amen. And so we've set this level of purity and holiness and expectation up so high that oftentimes we ourselves have to repent weekly or daily because we miss it all the time. 
So we've got to be able to talk and not yell. Now that's a word for people. I know it's a word for me, but let it be a blessing to you as well. I had not planned on going there, but the Spirit keeps driving me to this thing on burdens today for some reason. They take this woman and they humiliate her with no concept of wanting to help her. If these were the religious teachers of the law, shouldn't they be trying to get her right? Shouldn't they be trying? Shouldn't they be concerned about her heart matter? Shouldn't they be concerned about the issues at, at hand in her mind? Shouldn't they really be concerned about her sin? I mean, and they just want to kill her for it. They're willing to kill her and, 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 and jail Jesus and, hey, everything's okay. And so Jesus brings something at hand. He said, who else in here has not sinned? Amen. Dad, it's a good thing you weren't there. I mean, He said, he just said, you got that right. <laughs> what we cannot do as the church is be guilty of what the religious leaders of that day is doing. The, the religious leaders today need to do a self-examination and really make sure we're far away from the scribes and Pharisees as we can be. Look at it again. John chapter 8. Look at verse 4. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to come and stone such women. So what do you say? And this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Hear that. Jesus says to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. Listen to me. If anyone, if anyone had the right or the reason to judge her for her sin, it was God. The one who had the power to judge forgave her. The one who actually had the power to judge her forgives her. I'm going to say it again. The one who had the power to judge, he forgave her. So listen, I want you to consider this in your own personal life. What are you carrying around right now that needs to be forgotten about? Sometimes we could be our own worst judge, can't we? What are you carrying around right now that God is saying, I have forgiven you, I have forgiven you, I have forgiven you, I have forgiven you, leave it in the path where it belongs. The sin cast farthest from the east to the what? See, I think far too often we remember things that God has chosen to forget. Let me tell you why God forgets it. Because when it's washed by the blood, the blood works. The blood works. The blood works. You ever get a compound that's supposed to get stains out of clothing? Some are better than others. And you say, man, I'm not going to get that again. It didn't get the full stain out. Other ones got the stain out. Let me tell you something about the blood of Jesus. It gets the stain out 100% of the time. So we're still walking around like we've, we've got clothing with stain on it. And Jesus like, come on, man, I washed that outfit a long time ago. Now, see, that's a word for someone in here. He washed you a long time ago, and you're still carrying this baggage. You're still carrying this weight. You're still carrying this burden, and it's not because the blood didn't work. The blood worked. You're just, you're just still trying to carry it. Now, here it is. Watch this, because this is revelational for some people. It's actually really not there, because if the blood really works, and it left. Watch this. It's all up here now. <laughs> Just like I said last night, the only weapon the enemy has is a bag full of lies because the Bible says that Jesus disarmed the enemy at the cross. So when God the Father looks at us through the blood of Jesus the Son in this new covenant thing that he's done, when I ask God to forgive me, it works. 
so if I'm still bogged down over something that I asked him to forgive me for, and in faith I really believe that I'm forgiven, it's really no longer on me. It's in me. Because the battle is won and lost where? Some of you have to sit on that marinade on that for a while. You're carrying around stuff that's really not. God's already removed it. And all we have to do is begin to believe in faith and live like it's already gone. It's already forgotten. Something else interesting takes place with a beautiful act of God's mercy on display right here in the Scripture. What a beautiful act of God's mercy on display right here in the Scripture. Remember, church, remember what mercy is. Mercy is us not getting from God what we do deserve. We do deserve punishment, don't we? We do deserve punishment for all of the wrong that we've done. But, everybody say but. But thank God for Jesus Christ stepping in for us on the cross so that we could be forgiven and washed of our sins. Look at the 8th verse. John chapter 8, verse 8. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. Don't miss, listen to me, church, please listen to me. Don't miss the beauty of what just took place right here. It was the one-on-one -on -one moment with this woman and Jesus. Everybody say one-on-one. -on -one. Say it again, one-on-one. -on -one. Say it again, one-on-one. -on -one. It's so important. It's the one-on-one -on -one moment with, with, with this woman and Jesus, and it just changed her life. But isn't that how God still works today? When when we get all of the naysayers out of our ears, out of our minds, when we stop listening to the lies from the enemy and we simply just get before Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, he begins to change our lives. Remember, church, remember, no matter how long you've been a Christian, it's those one-on-one -on -one encounters with God that takes us to another level of our faith. It's the preciousness in God. It happens during worship. It, it happens during praise. It happens during quiet times. It happens when you're reading your Bible. It happens while you're in prayer. It can happen while you're driving down the road. That one-on-one that -on -one encounter can happen absolutely anywhere. And I thank God that Jesus Christ will meet us right here where we are right now. Jesus asked the woman, if you look at it in the 10th verse, Jesus said, woman, where are they? Now listen to me. Christians need to stop worrying about the judgment of others and focus on the call of God. Christians need to stop worrying about what other people think. Listen, because this is going to totally go against culture today, okay? But how many of you know the Word of God goes against culture, okay? Christians need to stop worrying about what other people think and begin openly living and sharing their faith again. As ambassadors of Jesus Christ, people around us should be seeing Jesus in and through us, and we should not be hiding the fact that we are followers of Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, listen. If sharing the gospel at your job gets you fired, then that ain't a job I would want anyway. If you can't love Jesus at your job without risk of being fired, why in the world would you want to work there? Now listen, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. Man, what a terrible trade-off. Well, I'm willing to get the paycheck, but I just can't express my faith. Ooh. See, we, we should not be worried or concerned about the judgment upon our lives. Our concern should be advancing the gospel message of Jesus Christ at all costs. Now, once forgiven, the lady did have a calling to live up to. Look at your neighbor and say, you got a call. She's got a calling to live up to. Jesus did expect her to live a life of righteousness. Look at the 11th verse again. She said, no one, Lord. There's none of them left. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go. Everybody say, go. He says, go. And from now on, sin, what? Everybody, everybody say it. How often? 
Jesus told her, I have forgiven you from the adultery, and I have set you free from it as well. Now watch this. This is essentially what he's saying. I've forgiven you. I've set you free. Don't go get wrapped up in it again. I've delivered you. I've set you free. Don't get wrapped up into it again. Here's the good news, church. Every time you receive the mercy of God, you've been forgiven. Expect change to come. When you receive mercy, expect change to come. You're called to walk in that change. God gives you the power by his Holy Spirit to walk in that change. All we've got to do is just walk in it. we just got to receive it. We literally have to walk in it through faith. God did his part. Now it's time for us to do ours. God did his part. Everybody say that. God did his part. Listen to me. There's accountability. I need you to hear this. There's accountability in the mercy of God, and there's an expectation from God in the mercy of God. We're accountable, and he expects some stuff. In other words, it's as if God were saying this. Okay, I'm going to hold my belt back from you, but I expect you to learn. I expect you to learn. You ever, you ever get in trouble as a child and you just knew your bottom end was going to get burned up? And it didn't, and you were like, Phew. thank you for the mercy. In closing, I'm going to read this last passage of Scripture. I want you to go to Luke 6, 32. Luke 6, 32. And this is good. This is good. There's accountability. There's expectation. When God's mercy is given to us by God, he allows us to get right with him. Can you say amen to that? When God gives us his mercy, he allows us to get right with him. We're going to close with this passage of scripture. Look at, the, look at Luke 6.32. Watch this, because this, 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 because this, this it concerns everyone in this room, myself included. Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. So it's easy to love people that love us, isn't it? It's easy to give to other people that give thanks to us, isn't it? Look at the 33rd verse. Jesus says, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good. Now listen to what Jesus is telling the church. He says, love your enemies and do good. Lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. I want you to see what Jesus just said concerning the Father. He's kind to the ungrateful. He's, he's kind to the evil. Now, do not get this concept twisted. He's not hand in hand with evil. God is holy. God is righteous. He does not put up with foolishness. But he's so kind unto the evil person, not the evilness. See the difference? So we, we love not the sin in a man, but we love the one who sins. See? The saying, I love the sinner, not the sin. So if God is kind to the ungrateful, if God the Father is kind to the evil, then no matter who walks through that door, we better be loving them. No matter who comes through there, we better look at them with the lens of Jesus. I don't care how sick they look. I don't care how hurt they look. I don't care how broken down they seem. Because Jesus says that he didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. He said it's not the healthy that needs a doctor. We should be with great expectation every time a broken vessel comes through those doors. Say, yes, God, 
you got another one that you're going to restore. Here comes another future testimony for your glory. Now watch this, because in this last verse, in the 36th verse, look at what Jesus is telling the church. Because the whole passage on the adulterous woman is really about the mercy of God. Remember, out of everyone in that room, he had the ability to judge her. And so look at what the 36th verse says. Let's read it out loud. Here we go. One, two, three, go. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Oh, remember what mercy is? Holding back judgment that is deserved. Amen. Holding back a judgment. You say, yeah, but Pastor, but they had it coming. Anybody ever said that before in life? Say, oh, they had it coming. Oh, they deserve that one. No, you don't understand, Pastor. I held back long enough. I'm thankful that God still holds back. Because he could have wiped me off this earth a long time ago. So what God says in that verse, look at it. He says, be merciful. Remember, hold back, hold back, hold back. In my holding back to someone that comes in front of me that's broken, it doesn't mean that I hold back from my Christianity. It doesn't mean that I hold back from a righteous call. It doesn't mean that I go down to their level. What it means is, is that I don't persecute them. I am willing to lift them up to where I'm at. I don't judge them. I'm willing to love them. And so look at what it says. This is huge. The church, that's you and that's me, Jesus says we're to be merciful even as God is merciful. Whoa. With all of the filth that's going on in this world, and how many people could say it's really bad right now? Like past Sodom and Gomorrah days, man, like really bad. And if God did that to Sodom and Gomorrah, you would be thinking, whoa, at any moment now, like fire could rain down on our heads. See, because we just see individuals and get riled up. The Father sees everything. He's omnipresent. He, we just see snippets on the news. He sees everything even behind closed doors. And he still hasn't balled up this planet and shucked it into the atmosphere somewhere. He still hasn't said, you idiots! <laughs> you foolish people! <laughs> I've forgiven you over and over and over again. I surrendered all of heaven and came down in flesh for you and put myself on the cross for you and bore your sins and I pour myself out to you and even when you ride down the road in your vehicles, I show myself to you in my creation. I'm constantly calling out to you and as a nation, you're still living like a wreck. Man with mercy. So the next time you get riled up by the news, and trust me, I'm guilty. There's been times, right now, I'm in the midst of it. I've shut my news off for a couple weeks. Because if I watch it one more hour, that television's going to be in the front yard of my house. Now, I'm just being honest with you. I'm just being real with you. So rather than ruin a good TV, I just have to turn it off. But how silly of me, because what I need to do is, instead of get down... Oh, I got to praise God for his mercy. Oh, God, your mercy, your mercy. All these people going through things and your mercy. They may be going through a wreck, but you've stopped them from being destroyed. Your mercy, your mercy, your mercy. And Jesus says, with that same mercy, you give it to everybody else. This is why he could say in the text, love your enemies. Whew. Let's stand and pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, for your mercy. The truth is, is that everyone in this room, saved or not, you have experienced in some way, form, or fashion the mercy of God. Trust me, you have. Trust me, you have. And I'm grateful for the mercy of my father over my life, over my wife's life, over our children's life, over this ministry's life. 
I'm grateful for God's mercy over every one of you in this room. I'm thankful for the mercy of God over this nation, over this planet, so that none would have to perish. And that's the mercy of God. So many people look at the grace and they focus on grace. And yes, grace is incredible. It's Jesus. That's grace. The gift that we don't deserve. But I still thank God for his mercy. See, the truth is I could never experience grace if I did not have mercy. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. I never could get into the realm of grace if I wasn't already bestowed mercy upon me. If you're in this room right now and you've never asked Jesus Christ to save your soul, you're going to have the moment to right now. It will change your life forever. It will change your life forever. If you're tired of doing it your way, let God do it his. But if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I just invite you right where you are to raise your hand. Anybody here that says, today's my day, Pastor. Today, today's my day. I've got to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've got to get on track. I've got to do it. I've got to do it God's way because my way, my way, my way is a failure. Every one of us have to come to that place in life. Every one of us have to recognize that. If you're in this room and you've walked away from the blessing of the mercy, you want to get just back on track and you want to be encouraged, I invite you to raise your hand right now. I'm going to say a prayer for you. If you'll receive it, I see you. I see you. I see you. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see you. Anybody else? I see you. I see you. Receive this. Father, in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, God, they have faithfully raised their hand to receive a blessing from you called mercy. God, I pray that through that, you already have encouraged them, but you would continue by the power of your Holy Spirit to encourage them and draw them in. Draw them in. Draw them in, Father. God, draw them into you closer than they've ever been before. That they would get back to their first love, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Redeemer. I pray in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ that you would encourage them that you would empower them by your Holy Spirit, that what has tripped them up will no longer be a hindrance. In the name of the blood of Jesus, we rebuke that, that what has tripped them up will no longer be a hindrance. But God, have your way and your will in them. Refresh them, anoint them, strengthen them. Father, I ask, please, Lord, that you bless them. Encourage them. And I'm praying for a special, fresh wind over their home, over their lives. God, I pray as they drive away from here today, it would feel as though they've been freshly charged. I pray that as they lay down to sleep tonight, they can't help but just celebrate the mercy that they've received. And I pray that over everyone as we leave here today, that we can't help but be thankful, celebratory, that we have received mercy from our Father. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, there is but one living, true God, and his name is Yahweh. Everyone said together, amen. Amen and amen. To God be the glory. Can we give him a clap of praise? Hallelujah. 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 Do me one favor. Sit down. I know I'm, well, no, this is still normal time. Sit down for a minute. Your crock pot don't burn stuff. Amen? Literally, give me one minute. Give me one minute. We have the opportunity to bless someone. But I want to bless Pastor Neil and his family. They didn't ask for this. They didn't know I was going to do this. But these guys right here came all the way from Texas to come help lead in worship, not just today, but every session over the course of three days, man. And it's just been incredible getting to know him, his children. How cool is it that he's got his wife up there uh, playing and um, she just picked it up like three weeks ago, right? Because their bass player wasn't able to come here. So he looks at his wife and says, hey, you got to learn bass, right? So 
you talk about a God gift, amen, because like, I've got a guitar sitting in my closet that I thought was great to get because I've always wanted to play piano and guitar, and so I bought my oldest son one and me one, and we were going to learn together, and he took off and just was blessed with the gift, and I was so busy, man, I ended up like it's still sitting in the, you know. So they haven't asked for this, but today they're going to pack their trailer up, and they're heading back to Texas. So number one, we're going to pray for them. Uh, But they had a rental place to stay out here. Um, They had their meals and stuff like that. And I just want to give you an opportunity to sow to them. If you don't feel led, that's okay. You know my style. I'm I'm no pressure. But if you do feel like helping the family that's getting ready to take a long trip back home, it will not only bless them, but I believe the blessing will be bestowed to you in return. So let's just pray for their safety, can we? Father, I pray for my brother, for his wife, for their children, even their children that are not here. God, I pray that as they travel, everything would just go smooth, and I pray it's even smoother than the travel they had up here. Up here, they were fighting a battle to get here because in the spirit realm, the enemy did not want them coming. But I pray going home, they can celebrate. God, I pray that they can just take their time and be a family. I pray that they could take their time, that they'd not rush and get into trouble, but that they would take their time and just enjoy one another. How rare it is that as families today, we can get away with each other. God, he mentioned that he's got a child, he's he's got one that is not saved. And so, God, we we just pray for complete victory in their family, complete victory in their family. Anoint them, favor them, and bless them. And as they go back to their church back in Texas, God, I pray that they would find it totally just ignited on fire for you, even more so than when they left it, even more so when they left it. Increase your favor there. In Jesus' name and blood, everyone said together, amen. 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 Love you, brother. Thank you. What better way to spend a Sunday? I thank you for coming and spending it with us. I hope to see you back next Sunday. If you're willing to give, you, if you have a check, you can just make it out to Christ Family Outreach Church, and I'll just forward it to him. Uh, but if you are willing, there's a well on that back table in the very back. It's got a hole in the top. You can just drop it down in there, and anything that you give and every part of it will go straight to bless this family. I love you. Be careful this week. Be in the Lord this week and in his will. Amen? God bless you, church. God bless you. Have a great week.